Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first CJFJ Talks Live program of 2021. I'm Natalie Turvey, President and Executive Director of the Canadian Journalism Foundation, and it's my great pleasure to be here with you today. For more than 30 years, the CJF has been supporting excellence in journalism through a variety of programs, and it's that time of year again for our CJF awards and fellowships that celebrate the exceptional work of journalists and news organizations across the country and provide important professional growth opportunities for emerging talent. While COVID-19 has challenged newsrooms and journalists in ways that we couldn't have imagined, it's also provided new opportunities for journalistic excellence that we look forward to celebrating. We're thrilled to expand our award offerings this year with a new Black Journalism Fellowship Program, a new CJF Award for Climate Solutions Journalism, and a new award for Digital News Innovation. We're now accepting entries for these awards and many others, so you can invite, uh, we invite you to visit our website to learn more and to apply. We know journalists love a deadline, so the due date for all submissions is February 19th. This JTalk series explores pressing media issues, and today's topic is among our most urgent. How news organizations connect, can connect with audiences and build trust and reach communities at a time of great change. With digital transformations brought on by the pandemic, new forms of storytelling that aim to meet audiences where they get their news, and a need for diversity in our newsrooms. We're able to explore these topics and others thanks to the generosity of our exclusive JTalk series sponsor, TD Bank Group. Thanks also to our in-kind supporters, CPAC and Cision. If you'd like to tweet about today's conversation, and we hope you do, the hashtag is JTalks Live. Today, we're joined by three speakers in three different cities. We're honored to have them with us to share their experience and their expertise on trust, tech, and change with intention in an effort to engage the diverse communities that media organizations seek to serve. Sandra Clark is Vice President for News and Civic Dialogue at Y, the public media organization serving the Philadelphia region. Nadine Ajaka is Senior Producer of Visual Forensics with the Washington Post. And Christopher Alexander is Assistant Professor with a focus on video games at the RTA School of Media at Ryerson University in Toronto. If you have questions for our guests, feel free to submit them anytime using the questions tab on your screen, and we'll make sure they get to our host. Thanks again for joining us, and now over to Anna Maria Tremonti to lead the conversation. Thank you, Natalie, and um, welcome, everyone. And I I'm going to just jump right in, and I want to start by going around and having each of you briefly tell us about the work you're doing. Sandra Clark, why don't you start? Oh, I think you're muted. I'm, I've there muted. I'm, I'm off a of mute. Uh, <laughs> good afternoon, and um, uh, thank you for the invitation. It's really great to be here and part of the conversation. Uh, so I am uh, Vice President for News uh, and Civic Dialogue at WHYY, which means that uh, I wear a bunch of different hats. Uh, one is at the executive level. I, I see myself as really being very much a part of uh, helping to continue to define and uh, refine what we mean as a public media station to our community at WHYY. Um, you know, sustainability is certainly uh, a very important um, conversation to have and to continue to work toward. 50% of our revenue comes from the public. Uh, and the rest is a, a, a mix of other kinds of funding, uh, including foundation funding, uh, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, we get uh, some of that high-end donor funding. So there is a cocktail of funding that supports the work that we do. But what I always say is that what makes uh, uh, public media special is that uh, we have the public supporting journalism to provide access for all. Uh, and that, that's a very important thing uh, uh, in, in, at any time and, and most certainly now. Uh, and the other hat I wear is as the, um, uh, I lead our newsroom uh, across all of our platforms. Uh, we are a dual licensee at WHYY in Philadelphia. So we are both television, uh, radio, and then of course we're, you know, digital web, podcasting, all of that. Uh, and then, and the other hat I wear is in civic dialogue. And it's really what took me to WHYY from newspapers. I previously was at Philadelphia Inquirer. Uh, and because I wanted the opportunity to meet the public 
always, right, to hear from the public. And so what I do in civic dialogue is I work with a team, my newsroom team, and we um, convene conversations with the public around issues of importance to them. Uh, and each and every time we talk to the public face to face, we learn something uh, that redirects our journalism, that deepens the work that we do uh, because relevance and connectivity and being uh, people, the public being seen and heard is uh, really very important to what we do. So Sandra, um, you've made some, ongoing changes with that newsroom. Just tell us a little bit about that. I think the, you know, priority uh, for me as, as a newsroom leader, um, you know, listen, I came into this business many years ago. Uh, I was one of those quote diversity hires. That is one of those terms that even continues to be thrown around today. Uh, I was brought into the newsroom um, as one of the people who, uh, you know, was there for representation, uh, really could provide a different view. Here we are in 2021 having exactly the same conversations about the need for diversity in journalism. Uh, you know, we're, I always say in journalism, we're really good at looking at other companies and other institutions and holding them accountable, right? We certainly talk about places that don't have diversity on their boards, don't have diversities in their comp diversity in their companies, less, less, uh, you know, accomplish about looking at ourselves. And so when I got to WHYY, I really was intent on, you know, what does reform look like in our newsroom? Uh, we cannot meet the mission of journalism if we do not have a diverse newsroom to start. And we haven't even gotten to the inclusion and equity part, right? We, we uh, most certainly need to uh, represent the communities that we cover and not cap ourselves. And so when I say that, a very common term in journalism right now is to say, you know, we need to reflect the communities that we serve. But, you know, as we know, you know, I mean, most most newsrooms are mostly white up to now, right? Most uh, newsrooms in, in the U.S., I think three-fourths of newsrooms are, are, are still mostly white. So what I looked at was what are, uh, where do we start at WHYY? Um, what are our barriers to diversity? And uh, we created a, what initially was a grant funded project and now it's just the work we do, which was looking at ourselves first. Um, uh, when I came to HYY four years ago, our newsroom was 80% white. And this is a newsroom created from scratch seven, eight years ago. Um, you know, with great intention, uh, you know, we have diversified our newsroom to the point where we are now 65% white after uh, a couple of years. Our makeup is completely changing and still continuing to change. And um, to those who might think that, you know, we have um, lowered our standards is all the stuff we hear about diversifying, right? Lowered our standards. We've, we, you know, we, we're just putting people in because they look a certain way or a certain way. Uh, what we know, journalists of color know, uh, people of color know is that we uh, most often than not have to be the cream of the crop to get hired. And so, each and every one of the people we have hired in our newsroom um, who was not white, um, you know, they killed it in their interviews. They, they, they brought what was unique about them to um, the storytelling. Uh, so we managed to, you know, really change the makeup of what we look like and continue to do so. But, but interestingly, we also started at the same time looking at our sources. These are the people we talk to every day, amplifying our journalism, uh, whose perspectives get seen and heard. Uh, and I, I don't think it's a big mystery that if you, you know, we had a newsroom that was 80% white and um, in, in our collection of data, and we continue to do that today, each and every uh, reporter, uh, producer has to input who they're talking to uh, by race, ethnicity, gender, uh, the role that they are, they play in the story. And what we found uh, initially a couple of years ago when we started this work was 80% of the people we were talking to were white, mostly male. Um, and, you know, it's also sort of an NPR thing that you're looking at experts in a certain kind of way. So you have to have a degree behind your name or somebody who has a certain expertise. So we're, what we've done with all of this work, uh, you know, we've also seen progress in in the diversity of the sources that we talk to and continue to do that. At any minute's notice, my project manager can show me a pie chart of who we're talking to and why we're talking to them. Uh, but at the same time, we've also combined it with building out our engagement, face-to-face -face engagement, and it's gotten much more difficult, obviously, with the pandemic. 
but in other ways, you know, Zoom has opened up opportunities for us to talk and, and um, you know, engage even a bigger, um, a, a bigger community in some ways, uh, not all, but we've also paired it with our engagement work. And so I have a community contributors uh, editor who uh, is out in the community all the time. Uh, uh, we have uh, started a new project called the News and Information Exchange, uh, which recognizes the work that many people in communities already do. So when we talk about trust building, you know, is from a big institution point of view, you know, we're thinking we're going to go in there, we're just going to just, you know, have trust, right? It's not, it doesn't work in relationships of any kind, right? Uh, and it most certainly doesn't work in journalism in that way, particularly when so much of coverage also has included trauma and misrepresentation in communities of color in particular. Uh, and so we have created a news and information exchange, which is a mutual aid um, project where we are working with, um, you know, content producers in communities. This is everyone from um, somebody who has an online radio show to someone who has a newsletter or a small publication. These are people already in their communities. They are already are providing vital information in their communities. Uh, and so the, the purpose of that project is to A, recognize the work they're already doing. And secondly, uh, is to partner with them and to figure out how do we, you know, how do we fortify what they do? Uh, and then how do we also introduce our journalists to them uh, so that, you know, we have opportunities to partner in stories. We have opportunities to talk about sourcing, uh, talk about what the real story is maybe um, compared to what we think the story is. Uh, and so we're, you know, really excited about that project because we have just met an incredible group of people uh, who maybe our newsroom never would have known, right? We Newsrooms, particularly big newsrooms, think that we've got the story and here it is. Uh, you know, just finding a diverse, a, a source who, who is not white does not, uh, does not change things. You have to build relationships. People have to see you and know you, and you have to be there when there isn't trauma breaking out in a neighborhood. You have to be there always. Um, so much to talk about uh, with what you're saying, and uh, especially when we weave uh, our other two guests in. So um, Nadine Ajaka, uh, can you tell us what you're doing at the Washington Post? Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for having me. I'm the senior producer for visual forensics at the Washington Post. So our mandate is to quite simply analyze and verify open source visuals and use that to um, inform people and kind of tell them what is happening. Um, and so inherent to that has been, you know, making sure that while our audience understands big news events, that they also have tools to, um, you know, uh, kind of ingest the sheer amount of video and visuals that are out there on any given day. So past projects have been um, working on a guide to manipulated video that's really sort of meant to be a public service and give our readers, um, you know, sort of tools to, um, a vocabulary to identify and to label um, manipulated or misleading video. And uh, at this moment in time, I would imagine you've been going through a lot of video from the January 6th event at the Capitol. Yes, hundreds and hundreds of videos um, from January 6th. And, um, you know, one of our most recent big projects is creating sort of a reconstruction of the 41 minutes inside the Capitol after it was breached and just kind of showing using geolocated video and interviews with lawmakers exactly how close um, the mob came to lawmakers who were in the Capitol at that time. Give us an idea of how many videos you have gone through just from that one day in order to do that kind of work. So I think we had, um, I think the byline was maybe seven or eight people on that. And each, we logged over 200 videos, which was, which were videos that we, um, you know, had uh, geolocated and sort of like mapped within the Capitol. But I think each person must have gone through 200 videos on their own. So it was definitely in the hundreds. Um, that's a lot. Um, Chris, I, I'm looking at your face there you're, as you listen to the other two. Tell us what you're working on. Oh, my goodness. Well, thank you all for having me. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm an assistant professor at Ryerson University, and I'm known as the professor of video games. I generally focus on three core areas. If you take a look at the bottom of your screen, 
if the lower thirds aren't cutting it off, you'll see it quite clearly. The three main areas, all related to journalism in some way, shape, or form. Fun fact, uh, the first one, if you take a look down below here, is video game design. That is how we make, create, and shape experiences for somebody other than ourselves. The second area is esports production, which, you know, is the reporting, the processes behind sort of like these on-screen things we've got going on here. And the last one is esports infrastructure. That is building, building facilities and programs and pathways for students to get jobs in the esports industry, as well as play in the competitive slash casual scene as part of their post-secondary education. That's a brief summary. I can keep going, but we have a limited amount of time, I'm sure. Well, you know, I'm going to start um, bringing the three of you together with what you do. And, and Chris, I'll just stick with you for a minute. So using the tools that you have with video games, I'm wondering if you look at your tools and if you look at the journalism goals of Sandra and Nadine, how can what you are doing and what you have learned and what you're teaching help them with journalism? Well, the brilliant thing, that's a great question. The brilliant thing that uh, Sandra had mentioned was about community and spending time with the community. Many of the things you're seeing go on on my stream right now are video game technologies that have been used by and for streamers that are on Twitch and YouTube. So these are the types of things we're doing while we play video games. And many streamers can be considered technical directors and producers just based on the, th the kinds of things that we're seeing here. So in terms of engaging with the video games community to find out how that style, even production broadcast can enhance the discipline, that's one core way, just connection to community, the video games community. Outside of the fun bits, what else can we use to port out to engage our viewers? And video games, they hold a lot of information there. And uh, we've seen now uh, politicians in Canada, Jagmeet Singh um, in the United States, AOC, actually engaging uh, new audiences and younger audiences and voters through, through video games. And what you're seeing is, again, both Jagmeet and AOC, they're members of the community. So it's normal for them to just waltz on in and do what they normally do. AOC actually plays among us. Jagmeet actually plays... Uh, no, AOC plays League of Legends and uh, Jugme plays um, Among Us as well. But what you're noticing is they're going to a place where their constituents wouldn't dare go. They're talking to the next gen because they understand that it's about community. And if somebody entering a new community cannot just openly say, hey, I'm new here, educate me, then it's going to be tough for them to enter. But you saw that 400,000 viewers, it was something where... They were already members of the community. They just harnessed that ability to say, hey, let's talk about this now or watch what we're doing here. Sandra, how do you think that you could you could use what what Christopher is talking about? Well, I, uh, I have actually seen some of this in action in journalism, which excites me so much about talking, uh, hearing what Chris is doing. Because one of the things we have at HYY is a, a middle school, high school program where, you know, we've got these young kids who are, um, you know, I mean, creating storytelling in, in the way their audience wants to see it. And so an example of that was uh, we could do a million stories about security in schools, for example, which we have. Uh, I saw a piece, a reported piece by one of the students where they actually gamified uh, walking down the hallway of their school and you really could feel that, you know, the unsafe points, right? Uh, and, I, and I thought about that, I'm watching it and I'm thinking, uh, my newsroom would not have created that, but if we're looking at another generation of young people who wanna do journalism, who wanna do storytelling, uh, and who did great reporting in this piece, but it really made me feel like I was walking down that hallway and that I was feeling unsafe. And as a parent, I, you know, I can only imagine what it must have been like for a student knowing that here are some really vulnerable points within the school. Okay, so if we take all of those ideas, and then well, I go to Nadine, because what you look at, of course, is the manipulation of things as well. So how do we use gamification in stories and stay true to a story? I mean, I think, you know, as I think our journalism needs to be iterative, period. I mean, I think that, you know, as, as the way that people get information evolves, so too must our reporting evolve. You know, I think that um, a lot of what 
my team does in terms of looking at open source visuals and sort of piecing together the story. I mean, that's a, a lot of people are seeing these things sort of in bits and pieces online. And when they come across it within a larger reconstruction, they do they're not necessarily seeing it for the first time, but it is being contextualized, which I think, you know, is is really helpful. Like I it's service journalism, it's accountability journalism to sort of contextualize snippets and bits and pieces of stories that people might see floating online, which is the method I think a lot of us get our news these days. Um, and so, and, you know, as uh, like, I think that, you know, the way in which we tell stories needs to be iterative. It needs to transport people and it needs to have a narrative flow that they're used to, um, that they like engaging with, you know? And so I think we can learn a lot from the way people play video games and understanding the sort of narrative arc that people like being taken on when we think about what's the best form for this story or format. Chris, what are you thinking? I, I'm just excited to hear such acceptance for video games. I spent my life, I'm a two-time globally ranked video game player when it wasn't trending. So you can imagine I've never pictured myself being in a room where people are like, yeah, we can learn something from video games. But no, it's a situation now where if we look outside of the, the, the fun bits, there's a lot to learn. Color, lighting, uh, access. These tools that you're seeing right now, all these transitions are part of free software. It means that a lot of students in their homes and future journalists can learn how to produce themselves like this. There are tutorials where you can learn how to position your cell phone using a cardboard cup, coffee cup, and cutting it out to position your phone for Zoom calls. There's free pieces of software that allow you to use your cell phone as a microphone if you don't have access to one. So these are the types of things that allow more people to report and as well as importing and transforming the way that we can tell stories. There's a lot of talk now about Zoom fatigue and how maybe there's limits, but the idea of being transported to anywhere at any time, that's something that often gets lost in the conversation. We have people that are in places and can transport you other places live and in context. So it's something that I'm excited to explore again, and I'm just happy for the opportunity to discuss it here today. Show us what else you can do there, Chris. I see you're playing. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's a viewer at home right now. I'm just pretending. So yeah, in my classrooms, <laughs> we do all these fun things to help contextualize education. And I don't think that it's limited to the classroom alone. Uh, the suggestion was that many students couldn't uh, sit in a Zoom conversation for more than three hours or up to three hours. But some of the trip ticks, tricks and tips that I give them just provide us these environments where students are like, how did he do that? Is that person real? Is that a loop? Is that Chris's friend? All of these questions are going through your head while listening to me simultaneously. Maybe, I don't know. But yeah, it's an opportunity to engage and extend stories beyond and give the storyteller a unique voice. Well, you know, and I'm really struck as well that the more, um, the more we have people engaging like this, the more media literate they become. So right now, um, Nadine, what you're doing, I mean, if more people, and you, you've done even the, you know, the videos on how to spot the, the, uh, the manipulation of images, but more people will be able to do that, the more literate we become on using all of these tools. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, we are we have entered an age where seeing isn't believing and just as it took people a minute to realize that still images could be photoshopped. So too, are we arriving at the, um, you know, at the realization that even if you see a video, it might not necessarily be a hundred percent what it purports to be, whether it's taken out of context or swaths of it are edited out to skew the narrative, or it's been, you know, doctored sort of in a more complete or sophisticated way. Um, and so, you know, I think that I firmly believe that as, um, journalists, when we give people the tools to label something, it makes it less scary. And so that was one of the main reasons behind creating a guide to manipulate video in the first place. I mean, it's not lost on me that you look at manipulated video and at this moment in time, you're looking at actually real video, often most of it uploaded by people who believed fake news and the real video is being used to report on them. And it's also being used by law enforcement authorities right now. It's like that, that very interesting, um, it, it twists the, it twists the, the, the original logic, but um, you're finding more information from the uploads from the people who don't believe what's really before them. 
Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think it's such an interesting time to be sifting through open source visuals, especially when it surrounds kind of really contentious events where, um, you know, you might have people who are uploading video who, you know, believe in a certain narrative, as you were saying. So it's definitely a kind of crazy time to be in this space. But um, I feel like, you know, our our sources are the public. And, you know, to me that there's something really kind of pure about that. And Sandra, I'm wondering, you know, when we talk about building trust, um, the more transparent we are, um, the more trust there can be. And the more the audience knows how to play the game, then the more everyone has to stay transparent, do they not? Oops, uh, you're muted. You think I'd have that down by now, but uh, it's it's kind of twofold. I mean, I think one is you know participation, right? And so what's kind of very interesting about uh, what Nadine and Chris do is that you know even asking that question like how'd you do that, uh, you know who did that, uh, you know it, it that curiosity I think is is really important. But we also have to think of transparency as being an untrusted space too, right? Because People look at transparency and go, well, who's telling me that we're being transparent? And, and uh, you know, how do I know I should believe you? I mean, think about how many of us have never met a journalist growing up, right? I've met a nurse, I've met a doctor. I, I mean, I, I never met a journalist growing up. I have no idea about the rigor of the profession. I can't tell one organization from another. And, and so I think it's really important. There's still something, um, uh, nothing beats face-to-face, -face, nothing beats being in personal dialogue with communities. So I think of uh, one time when I took my newsroom, what we're also trying to do is, is, is take our members of our newsroom out into the public uh, and have them have people read our stories and, and, and then get their feedback, right? And in one of these exchanges, someone in this neighborhood who we wrote a, a story about a development that was happening there, they said, well, why did you talk to that source? Uh, and the reporter uh, said, well, um, I talked to that source because uh, they give good quotes, right? And so I think for us, it's to drill down to, well, what did you mean by that? Because I'm looking at this reporter saying, what did you mean by that, right? Um, and it turns out that uh, what he meant was that it was a source who, I mean, we're also a radio space, uh, you know, broadcast space. So source who could explain something very quickly, very concisely. Uh, and, and there you go, you have your great quote for your, your piece. It did not sit well in the room, right? I mean, people said, well, uh, okay, so that's your barrier, that's your bar for us. How do we learn to do that? You know, we've got great information too. How do we learn to do that? So you call the same source over and over again uh, because of that one reason, well, why are the rest of us not included in that? So there's transparency, right? I mean, he's admitted what it was, but what he also exposed in that answer, and I'm glad he was honest about it, was uh, th that's actually not the problem of the community we're talking about, that we're looking for good quote. <laughs> you know, We've got to find other ways of um, getting voices into our journalism that are not that bar uh, for us. And uh, that gets back to even finding the voices and finding the people you're talking to and figuring out who they are. And, and Chris, um, tell us more about your own, the demographic that you reach out to every day. Well, I guess it depends on who I'm talking to. If people are trying to learn more about video games in the community, that demographic skews, uh, I guess it's 51 up, the average age of the full-time university professor and elementary school teacher. Uh, when I'm in the classroom though, I'm generally speaking to video game players and esports enthusiasts, which range between 18 and 35 years of age. So um, what's beautiful about these two age ranges that I just described is that none of it matters in terms of captivation and engagement. If you are able to like things in a particular way, if you're able to cultivate a story, if you have the community behind you, people will listen. Again, it's about creating pathways and opportunities for voices to be heard. And it helps once you have control of your own technology, if you have access to it, and even with whatever limited technology you have access to, you can put something out. It's imbuing yourself with the ability to be able to bring a message out there. Because a lot of the times, a couple of sessions with myself and students, and even what I like to call grownups, it's like, wait a second, I can do this too. Yeah, 
if you want to, there are always ways to find a way to get your message out there, I feel. And it's difficult for some, but I know when there's a will, oftentimes people will push forward to try and find access and some way to engage with an audience. Just one other person at least. So, Chris, when you look at traditional media, if you're listening to the radio or watching TV or reading a newspaper or reading something digitally, um, like how, what are you thinking sometimes? Do you sometimes come across something where you say, wow, I could have helped them tell this story so much better? Well, the truth is, all I do is think about my research. <laughs> and uh, one of the things I do know is the crux of my research work is that humans tend to engage with multimedia in three core ways, and I argue a fourth. The first one is audio, the second one is text, and the third one is vi video. In all these cases, whenever you have two or more, so like audio and text, learning gains are higher. That means what we take in is more. But now you add this idea of interactivity, i.e. a video game, which serves for autonomy. I'm gonna control when I'm going to engage because, and this is a controversial statement, there's not a single video game where you're not learning something. That's part of the draw toward video games because how does this work? Oh, I got it, or ooh, I, I'm gonna try and do this differently, but it's quicker than any assignment feedback you could get. So what I feel is when I'm looking at news, I'm like, hmm, this could have been said in a different way. This could have been told in a different way. But I'm wondering if the other human on the other side knows that there are different ways to captivate. And if there are ways to grant autonomy to the consumer in a way that says, ooh, let me, let me see when and if I'm going to consume this. I mean, when you really look at the, the trajectory of news coverage, we have, we have always been dealing with new technology. We shouldn't be af afraid to keep moving on that front. Well, one would imagine. However, uh, the giving of autonomy in some ways is a difficult thing to consider, particularly if you've been doing it um, unidirectionally for a certain amount of time. Wait a, wait a minute. What do you mean I'm going to give you a long form interview and the students who are in journalism school could cut it and edit it just to show us how many different ways a story could be cut? That gets a little bit closer to what Nadine is doing and how we can transform and, and move and shift the narrative depending on how things are edited. Imbuing humans with the power to be able to, wait a second, how would I tell the story? How could I tell the story? What would happen to news outlets, for example, if the stock information was released to the community for different areas to remix it? Just a random thought experiment. I don't know, but I can imagine that the effect of that would be transformative, particularly if the news was reported on a particular community. Well, I'll go to some questions now. I've got a question here from Paul G. Will the future of interactive news live on platforms like Instagram or TikTok, or is there still room for news organizations to invest in interactive innovations within their own ecosystems? Who wants to tackle that? Who wants I, to I, I can tackle that, yes. Go. It can exist there and it will exist in long form. My suggestion is it will continue to bridge out, but in terms of validity, that's the actual competition that's going on right now. What are we saying? Who are we talking to? Who does this benefit? Why is it being said? What does this mean? So I would imagine that the platforms are always gonna change, but the messages in the communities that they serve, they're constantly in a state of flux and staying abreast with that is what the ongoing challenge, in my view, is going to be. It's not going to be the platform. It's going to be the message attached to the platform. The, my, our other two guests are nodding their heads. I just want to hear from e each of you. Sandra, go ahead. Oops. Um, you can you can all just unmute yourselves. It's okay. That way we can. No, Chris is right right on right on on that one. Uh, and I you know I have a what, 20 24 year old daughter. She's not reading WHYY every day, but boy, is she plugged into so much stuff. Uh, and it and it really is about you know are we creating pathways for these voices to be heard, uh, for these communities to be understood uh, and, and received, right? So uh, when we work with our news and information exchange partners, for example, uh, you know one of the, one of the things we say is please don't try to retrofit who you are and what you do to what you think we want. You know your value is what you already are doing, uh, so you don't have to you know get the NPR voice out there. You don't have to you know package things in a way that you think WHYY wants. It's for us to look at what you do and help you uh, amplify the value with our communities as well, right? And, and, and let alone your 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 own. Uh, so I that is that is so true. I mean it's just and I think as leadership, 
you know, when I, when Chris was talking, I was thinking like, you know, all the kind of gatekeeping that happens throughout, right? Who gets to decide who, 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 who what communities we're going to devote our resources to? Who gets to decide, um, you know, whether we think this is a priority for our organization? I think all of that, when we talk about reform, all of that has to be challenged all, all throughout the organization. Mm -hmm. Nadine, what do you think? Yeah, I think the question was about, you know, sort of, um, platforms and the degree to which um, news organizations like need to kind of follow the platforms and follow the audience in order to stay innovative. I think, you know, definitely we can look at um, platforms as tools to um, help get information to our audience. But at the same time, there are limitations, you know, I mean, there's definitely um, like kind of monetization constraints on certain platforms. There's you know, definitely like platforms have APIs, so you can better integrate your storytelling with them, but it's never going to, you're never going to have the sort of like autonomy to experiment as you would with your own kind of owned and operated platform. And so I definitely think that some of the most innovative stuff that the Washington Post does, for example, is on the WashingtonPost.com. And so the question becomes like, how can we use um, these platforms to to draw people there, to maybe um, highlight key findings, but also eventually like get people to engage with our storytelling on our engine operated. And so, um, you know, that's a question I think that a lot of a lot of news organizations are grappling with because your audience isn't sometimes just not going to be is going to be off platform. And so, how do you balance the two? It's a crucial question, um, but I definitely think there's space to innovate. Um, I, I, we're getting um, we're getting uh, some questions that are a bit off from what you're talking about. So I'm going to try to just really stick to the ones that are uh, very specific. Uh, uh, Reverend Karen Harrison is asking, how do we better use technology to create true, honest, accurate news in a time of polarity? So how do we use all this, Sandra? Oh, wow. Uh, 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 I still think, you know, it, I'm not sure it's the technology as much as the people. You know, okay. and um, and so, you know, understanding, uh, you know, how how information is put together, uh, understanding the impact of, of how you share that information, uh, you know, understanding manipulation. I mean, I think all of those kinds of things, uh, you know, it still comes down to people. Chris Alexander. Oh, uh, you know, for me, it seems like generally we're navigating the difference between cool and care. So there's this push, depending on the medium, for people to try and be cool. But if we were to lean towards the side of care, what might things look like? Caring for a community, caring for a particular group, caring for the future and longevity of particular groups, that changes the narrative entirely, right? Um, if we're looking at how do we imbue future generations with the tools to be able to tell their own stories, you're also in effect saying to them, equip yourself with a skill that somebody else is willing to pay for and you'll be fine. Nadine, what do you think? I think technology can be really useful only to the degree to which we are transparent about using it. And so I think that that comes down to story, the method of storytelling. And so, you know, if you use a software to, uh, you know, count the number of people in a place, say that you used it, you know, if you sifted through this amount of documents or videos, say it, you know, and so I think that, um, you know, transparency can be, um, like showing our work is, is huge and only going to become more important in a time of polarization. We get this question almost every time, but it always fits. Uh, what advice do you have for journalism school graduates? I want to hear from each of you on this one, especially in, as we talk about new ways to tell stories and new places to tell them. Sandra? Ah, um, well, you know, I'm always uh, impressed with the graduates who, who come in and or applicants who come in and are talking literally about community and people. Uh, you know, it's, it's easy to kind of get caught up in, you know, I, I do long form journalism, here's my podcast, here's the this, here's the that. Uh, but but I, I like to hear what the heart of why somebody is, you know, why someone wants to be a journalist. And it's fu funny, like, you know, we talk about actually going out in the communities, particularly communities of color, which, you know, I, I, all these terms underserved, underrepresented. And, and, and my question is, well, how long are we going to stay underserved and uh, underrepresented, right? 
so I, I'm always eager to talk to someone who is interested in building community and community and audience are two different things. Uh, so if, they, if you can talk about people, you, 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 you've got my attention uh, already and then we can talk about other skills, uh, but getting the heart of how do we meet the mission of journalism uh, which sometimes we're very far from that, right? Sometimes we do great things, uh, but representation matters. And so I'm looking for that person who's, who, who is as interested in going out there and spending a day in a community, just, just, just soaking it up, right? Than I am in somebody who's, you know, got all the technical skills and, 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 and the packaging skills, right? You need both, but, but I, I'm, I, I lean toward the people. Nadine? Yeah, so I went to journalism school and I'm going to, um, somebody gave me a really good piece of advice when I was 23. So I'm just going to regurgitate that piece of advice. It is not mine. I want to be clear about that. But they told me that whatever job you think you're going to have in five years, you're not. And so that is the advice that I would give to somebody who is graduating from journalism school um, soon or in a couple of years or is thinking about going to J school that, um, you know, a big, big strength is going to be in your flexibility and um, in being able to evolve and be open to new opportunities. Um, both, uh, both of you giving great advice now, uh, Christopher, what do you say you're, you're in that, you're in the school you've got, you know? The <laughs> yeah, I would say what I normally say to the students, which is this, you are the future of journalism, show me. Be it, do it, what it looks like for you, make it happen. That's what I say. That's a really good point. That's, um, uh, you know, um, no one owns journalism. And the, the generation coming into journalism, if they think it's broken, they have a right to fix it in a way that they think it needs to be fixed, mm -hmm. right? Um, well, thank you all of you um, for this. We're almost out of time. I just maybe as uh, just as we uh, close up, um, just again, maybe your thoughts a little more on how we how we take all of the changes and all of the uh, not solely the technological changes, but the real societal changes we face right now. We are in a pandemic. There is a racial reckoning going on in journalism and outside. And, um, and there's great, there has been, there is great political change and upheaval. How do we take this and still find a way forward where the messages that we are reporting and giving can still ensue some kind of trust or regain trust? Well, I'll start. Uh, you know, I, I think that uh, journal if journalism is about truth, then then the whole cold hard truth within our own newsrooms, uh, we we have to create a language around that. We have to create structures in terms of changing the things that we know uh, need to be changed. So I, I'm I'm all about the inside work, uh, and while we're doing the outside work, right? I, I I truly believe most people get into journalism with a real deep mission to have impact and to, to bring change. Uh, at the same time, I think that there's so many things that, um, you know, really continue to haunt journalism in terms of, you know, being real barriers to doing the work that we need to do. And we've got to, we've got to do that work. And it's, and, the, and there's no risk in that. Everybody looks at the risk in, in doing that work. There, there's no risk. It's, 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 necess it's necessary, right? Nadine. Yeah, I, I'm in total agreement with Sandra, and I, I, I believe the work is, you know, is really internal. I feel like the, the, um, you know, range and depth of our storytelling can only be as good as the diversity of our teams. Like, I, it makes the work better. Period. And so, as an industry, like we need to say that equity, inclusion, all of that is like is a cornerstone of the work that we do. Like it is not a side thing for someone else to worry about um, because it directly um, impacts the, the work that we put out. And then as a result, the trust that people feel um, in the publications that they read. Christopher Alexander. Uh, I would just suggest um, equip yourself with a skill and connect that skill to a community. 
Um, we're going to have to end it there, but uh, uh, the three of you have given us some really important things to think about and um, uh, just really, you know, turn them over and make us think some more, which is really important. I think that um, all of you see that the work that needs to be done and we need to um, look at ourselves and get busy and do that work and continue to. So thank you. Thank you for your time today with the CJF. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for having us. And that is uh, you know, uh, Sandra Clark, Nadine Ajaka, and Christopher Alexander. There's lots to take away from this conversation um, and from their ideas. Thank you for joining us and thank you for your questions. We couldn't get to them all. Um, join us for our next show, February 25th. We will explore the challenges faced by President Joe Biden and the media in navigating race and political issues inflamed during the Trump presidency. My guests are Aaron Harris, co-founder and editor-at-large for The 19th, a news organization focused on women, politics, and policy. As well, from The New York Times, opinion columnist Jamel Bowie and national political reporter Ested W. Herndon. And save these dates as well. March 3rd, I'll be speaking with Alan Rusbridger about his new book, News and How to Use It, what to believe in a fake news world. Alan Rus Rusbridger will be joining us from the UK where he is chair of the Reuters Institute for the Study of Journalism. He's the former longtime editor in chief of The Guardian. And one more, May 13th, I'll be joined by David Remnick, editor of The New Yorker, the beloved weekly magazine that is the gold standard in long form journalism and personal essay writing. So mark those in your calendars. Uh, I'm looking forward to those discussions and hope you can join us. And if you want updates on these events, uh, follow the Canadian Journalism Foundation on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, or visit the website of the CJF and sign up for our newsletter. Thank you for watching and we'll see you next time.